we need our stress system so I get the heck over across the street before I get run over, right? But in addiction, what we know is that this system gets overactivated and stays activated, not only during acute withdrawal, but during protracted abstinence. So let me give you a quick example. This is a, a Peter the Younger's copy of a Peter the Older, um, a Bruegel showing that even in the, in the Middle Ages, uh, the debauchery associated with alcoholism, she's pulling them away from the bar where everybody's having a fight. Right? So again, without getting into a lot of detail, I showed you that I could get rats to drink alcohol, but how do I get rats that are alcoholics? How do I make rats dependent? Well, there's a whole series of things we do, but first we train them to drink alcohol. That's the left-hand side of the left-hand panel. Then we actually make them dependent by exposing them to ethanol vapors or an ethanol liquid diet. This is an example of ethanol vapors. And we put them in the vapors for 14 hours a day, and we take them out for 10 hours a day. And we test them at six hours into withdrawal, two to six hours into withdrawal. And what you can see is that the animals escalate their intake of alcohol. And they're taking pretty strong amounts because they're maintaining blood alcohol levels around 150 milligram percent now, not 20 or 40 milligram percent. That's about six beers or six glasses of wine, maybe eight. So these animals are drinking a lot of alcohol in 30 minutes. This is in 30 minutes they're putting it away. So it's like they're chugging a six pack in 30 minutes, right? Because they're in withdrawal and they're not happy about it. So they're drinking a lot. And the next slide I'm going to show you is one of the most dramatic things we've ever seen in the field so far. And that is we can reverse the excessive drinking of these animals by injecting a CRF antagonist into the central nucleus of the amygdala. And you can see here, the black bars are the non-dependent animals. These are animals that, that are social drinkers. They're not allowed, they're not made dependent. And the CRF antagonist has no effect. So it wouldn't affect social drinking if we had a CRF antagonist. But the CRF antagonist reverses the dependence-induced drinking. It's a pretty dramatic effect. We've seen similar effects recently with a kappa antagonist. It blocks the dynorphin system. We're beginning to see a pattern of results with our animal studies that suggest that reversing the brain stress system activation can, in effect, reverse dependence. And just to bring home the, the, the significance of this a little further, if you, uh, if, if you do microdialysis in the animals during withdrawal and you measure CRF in the amygdala, you see an activation. And I'm not going to go through the slide, but suffice it to say, even marijuana withdrawal raises CRF in the amygdala. What I'm trying to tell you is that a really major component, and this is a simple take-home message here, a really major component of addiction, by no means the only major common component of addiction, but one of the major components of addiction is um, that when you're not dependent, you have a functional reward system that works fine. And your negative reinforcement system, your strain, brain stress system, is relatively quiescent. And that's what this slide shows. When you're dependent, you lose your reward system, the one that's normally active, and you gain the stress system. So you've, you've got a, what I call a double whammy effect. Now, for those of you thinking about, well, how did you get here in the first place? Well, there are multiple ways to get here. One, you could be born this way. And I hate to say it, but what if you're born with low dopamine and high CRF? In effect, you're screwed, right? Now, aren't that many people born that way? And we don't have the genes to, to, to argue that those kind of polymorphisms really exist. But another way you can get this way is you could be stressed as a child. You could be living with a mother or father who is a drug abuser. You could be separated and isolated because you didn't get any proper care. All of these things contribute to this. But another way you can get there is you can take a lot of drugs. And in the end, you end up in the same place. Now, I want to end very quickly. I have a few minutes left with my timing. Um, I want to end and talk a little bit about craving. This is a very, very hot area in the neurobiology of addiction. Um, we're doing a little bit of work in this area, but other people have done more and some quite elegant work. And I want to just give you a taste of what's going on because, again, your tax dollars are paying for it. And the hope is that ultimately 
our understanding of the craving process will, will allow us to intervene in individuals to keep them off the drugs and to avoid those changes I've just showed you. So this is a very old from Lancet in, in 1890. I have a patient who suffers from cocaine craving. I find it impossible to keep cocaine out of its reach. This habit has brought him into a very low state of health. Perhaps some of your readers might be able to give me some suggestion as to treatment. I've tried the usual remedies in vain. He suffers from great nervousness, sleeplessness, and has become very thin. So what is the craving circuit? Well, I told you it's a cortical circuit. It involves structures in the brain that project down to the reptile brain, to our reward system and our brain stress system. Um, they have different functions, and I can regale you with fascinating stories about what all these brain bits do, but the next slide kind of gives you a, a taste of it, and that is that we know that internal cues of our internal state, many of which are negative from stressors, come up through the amygdala, which projects into the reptile brain. Uh, we, the orbital frontal cortex and uh, prefrontal cortex are heavily involved in evaluating stimuli in the environment, putting them in cognitive context, and making decisions. The frontal cortex is compromised in addiction, it's in chronic high-dose alcoholics, and it's compromised in methamphetamine and cocaine users, and they can't make good decisions and the decisions they make seem to be heavily weighted toward relapse. And then the hippocampus and this structure uh, probably is involved in context. And so you sometimes wonder how does the person end up back at that bar or back at that dealer? They're not even thinking about it. It's below, you know, kind of consciousness. And that would be hippocampal perhaps. The other thing to mention to you is that one of the major transmitters involved in all those black arrows that are going here, there, and everywhere, but you can see them converging on the nucleus accumbens, VS, ventral striatum, or nucleus accumbens, they contain a transmitter called glutamate. Glutamate's an excitatory transmitter. It's very prevalent in the brain, but one of the things we know in animal models during relapse, glutamate activates dopamine to give it a, you a taste of dopamine, and that contributes to the relapse phenomenon. 